All right, is everyone ready? Feeling good, feeling relaxed? Lunch is up next, so this is a tough task for me to keep you entertained for the next 50 minutes or so. Let me say first that I'm very excited to be here. Very, very excited. Uh, I love coming to the UK. I'm not kissing ass right now. I really love coming to the UK. Uh, when I check my joined in stats, my best ratings are always in the UK. I don't know why, it's, I think it connects well. Uh, like when I talk back home in, in Belgium or when I go to the Netherlands to speak, everyone is very quiet. Now, uh, unlike in the US, where people are very rude some, from time to time, the Brits seem to mix and match that. You're very talkative, but very polite, and that's why I'm very excited to be here, so thank you for having me. Now, uh, my name is Thais, but I'm, I'm seeing to notice that a lot of UK speakers, or a lot of UK people, have difficulties pronouncing my name, so if you ever want to walk up to me and say my name right, just think of this, this is a taser, you just say Thais. Okay, now we got that off, we can continue. I'm a professional evangelist. Uh, I work in the hosting industry, a company called Combell. We're a web hoster. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone has heard of us, but anyway, I'm not going to try to plug as much as I can. Let's keep it civilized here. I'm also part of something you might know. Who knows PHP Benelux? Hands in the air, please. Ooh. I would call that a lot of room for potential. <laughs> Who was at our conference? Yay. Still lots of potential there. So this is me doing the closing notes. So if you ever want to stop by at a really nice community conference, a little bit smaller than this, but with all the good things like Belgian beer, fries, chocolate, everything you need, good talks. We even have a bowling alley. Just sign up next year. I would appreciate that. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, this is the handle. If you're interested, do so. If not, just don't. And please, 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 please rate my talk on joined in. It's very, very important to me because then I know if I have to adapt some certain, certain things, if I should keep certain things. And it's also good for conference organizers. If I really do a bad, bad job here and you mention it, they won't select me again. So please be nice, but be honest. And I have to admit this is the first time I'm doing this talk, so be gentle. Thank you. Let's kick it off. What's cloud? And that is a question to you. What is cloud? Are there brave souls who are willing to answer that question? Brave soul. Okay, I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to continue unless you answer the question. So we have 50 more minutes. Just shout. Yes. It's the correct answer. Yeah. Uh, maybe a word of, of warning here. There will be no wrong answers. I'm very sure. I've tried this a lot of times. No one gives wrong answers. So that was a good one. Thank you. Any more? I need three before I continue. Yes, yes. Fluffy stuff in the sky. It's also a correct answer. Third one, I'm proving my theory. Last year's buzzword. Last year's buzzword the cloud. Last year it was 2010's buzzword, but it extended over 2011, so you're absolutely right about that. Uh, anyone know Andrei Smievsky, who spoke here last year? He told me that's where rain comes from. That's the cloud tool, according to him. But according to me, in the very essence, cloud is just the internet. And I could end this talk right now and go home and say, well, I told the people what I needed to tell because the cloud is basically the internet. But I have a, a more elaborate explanation about what the cloud is. And this is a slide, this, I recover this slide all the time. Every talk I do about cloud, either from a, a technical perspective or from a marketing perspective, always has that one in it. So for me, I just highlighted what's important for you. It is a model, model. It is not a technology, it's not a philosophy, it's not the next big thing, it's not, it is fluff in the cloud, but it isn't supposed to be that way. It is a model on the internet. We're not talking about selling women's underwear. It's the internet. This is our core business. And we're talking about a two-way pattern. Delivery, people who deliver stuff on the internet. I think that's majority of you, developers, sysadmins, people who contribute to the internet. And then again, people using it. And what we want, very particularly, is to have flexibility. We want increasing flexibility. Why is that? Because times are changing. The internet is changing. Everything is turning more mature. And we want that flexibility. And how do we achieve that? To abstract certain things. And that's, that's the essence. And this picture proves it. This is also one I recover all the time. This is cloud according to me. So what do you see on this image? Yes, yes. Thank you. you are, I've done similar talks dozens of times. And you are the first one to, who talks about the lady vacuuming in the back. Because that's the essence of this picture. It's not about the plug and the electricity. We abstract that. The person is just focusing 
on the core business at hand at that time, and that is vacuum cleaning, nothing more, nothing less. The person is not interested how electricity works and how, which generator it's connected on. We don't care, we abstract that. And that's what the cloud is all about. But we need to translate that in things we understand because I'm not gonna fill a 15 minute talk with vacuum cleaners and power plugs. What we need is, and we're gonna discuss applications here. It's not gonna be about the cloud in general. We're gonna apply it to development and sysadmin standards. It's an application that is always available. Is it always fast? Fast enough? It's also good. We don't want, like if we can have top performance, that's okay, but that's not really the goal of the cloud. We just have constant performance. And that's where scalability comes in next. That's also a big issue. We want to scale out, to scale in, scale up, scale down, and keep that performance constant depending on the number of requests we get. And something that is less popular for developers because we are like Rasmus discussed it with the hammer. We're that kind of guys, right? Who loves playing with the hammer? Proverbially, I do. A lot of people do. But it's focusing on using te technology instead of inventing technology. Reinventing the wheel, that's something we hear at conferences all the time. Do what you're good at. And who's a developer here? A lot of people do what you're good at, develop. And who doesn't feel comfortable playing around with Apache configs and Linux setups? Who is frightened to do so? Be honest. Like, we have a brave soul here who says he's not really comfortable doing that. That's what the cloud is invented for, for people to be able to focus on their own thing and leave the rest to others. So we want everything as a service. We talk about software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. I shouldn't be explaining this, right? Everyone knows what I'm talking about, PaaS, IaaS, SaaS. Well, the goal is, if you can achieve it, to go higher up the stack. As high as, and, and the stack is at the bottom, infrastructure as a service, in the middle, platform as a service, and on top of things, you have software as a service. Well, if you can climb up that ladder as high as you can, it gets efficient. Maybe you, a, a question for you guys. If you want email, like say your grandmother wants an email address, how are you gonna help her? Look, he says Google Apps. Like 20 years ago or 15 years ago, we would have said, yeah, we're gonna set up a mail server, and we're gonna configure that and make sure you have the right software for it, and we're gonna create a mailbox, make sure the email address is synced correct, and then we need to make sure it's available, so we might want to put it in a data center. All these questions, all these difficult things, we can abstract. We say, well, we use Google Apps, or we use Office 365, or we, let's be commercial, come to us and order a mailbox. You can do that. So if you can go up higher in the stack, that's a good thing. But when you get too big, like when other aspects start to dominate, like where's my data? Uh, is it redundant enough? Then people tend to go back down and go to like infrastructure platform as a service where they still can manage certain aspects. And it comes with e economic advantages. This is not a marketing conference, so like at marketing conferences, I spend half an hour explaining this. Let's not do it. Let's summarize it with less money, less effort, less risk, and in the end, less worries. So let's keep us relaxed. And uh, there's hybrid in my talk. It's, it's kind of a buzzword. It's like uh, cl cloud is last year's buzzword. This is this year's buzzword, more or less, because a lot of people <coughs> believe that it's not about picking one vendor. Like, hybrid lets you do that. But it's just a fancy way of saying that you can pick the pieces of the puzzle yourself. If you like an aspect of Amazon, you take it. You combine it with something that Microsoft does. And maybe you can use some sort of CDN and your storage, you want high SLA, you buy it at a hosting company. And you can mix and match all of that stuff together and come up with one solution that works for you. And, and this is what I will be discussing. So <coughs> I'm going to talk. I think I'm only going to talk a minute about what we do, just to give you some information. But the majority of things will be uh, Amazon, a bit of Windows Azure, also a bit of Orchestra, because I like the guys. They're good. And uh, Cloudflare, very briefly. So who has been using Amazon before? Who has experienced it? OK. Let me admit that I don't have a huge amount of experience with Amazon. But I've been working in the hosting industry for eight years now, so I know how it works. And it's not our core business, but it's a goal of mine to know what's out there, to give you proper advice, because I could be bashing Amazon and saying you should buy stuff at our company, but that would be wrong. Uh, just mix and match, see what works for you. Uh, who has been using EC2? I think everyone that raised their hand is using EC2. Who's using uh, S3 for storage? Is there anyone using CloudFront on top of that? It's a lot of people, nice. Who is using RDS? Less people. We should talk about that. Has anyone tried DynoDB, the new one? Did you try it? Was it 
Good, I haven't tried it myself. Okay, so let's keep an eye on that. <coughs> Simple DB, I haven't played around with that. Who, who's used Simple DB? Look, it, it's less like EC2 is, is really out there. Elastic Cache? Did you like it? Yeah, it works. It's, it's, and that's something typical about moving it up the stack. Like you can set up an EC2 node, install memcached, and then you have your own memcached farm. What Elastic Cache does is offer that as a service. So that's the stack apply. Same thing for RDS. You have your database system, you have Oracle or MySQL databases as a service. But by consequence, they cost more. So be careful there. So that's what we're going to use. Like it, this is our toolbox for, uh, for Amazon. Who has used Azure before? <laughs> wait, wait, let, let, let me try that again. Who has used Azure before? Come on, guys, be nice, because I got some budget from, from Microsoft to get one of their consultants to explain me everything, and I promised to send them the footage. Like, I know we're being videotaped right now. So again, who has tried Azure before? One person. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But then again, uh, if the dear people of Microsoft are watching, there's a lot of potential here. You should sponsor this stuff. Okay, so that's what they do. They offer computing as well. But it's a different thing. We don't, we're not talking about installing a load balancer. We're not talking about setting up infrastructure for that. No, it's already there. It's abstracted. So what platform as a service essentially is, it's infrastructure as a service, your services, with, with the sort of building blocks on top of it. And that's ideal for you if you don't really like setting up servers. The infrastructure is there. The web server is there. It's configured. And it's out there. That's these are the basics. And they do offer something similar, like S3. They offer blob storage, table storage. Like, oh, this is a typo. It should be blob storage. It's similar to S3. This is similar to simple DB. They offer CDN as well that stacks up on the, the, the storage. And they offer SQL Azure. It's similar to RDS. They offer data synchronization services. Unlike Amazon, it connects well with your uh, how would you call it again? Active Directory farm, so it does authentication. And they also offer a service bus that is, does some caching, that does some, uh, some job queuing. So they offer a fair amount of tools, and I heard from reliable sources, but I can't disclose who said it, because otherwise I would be in big trouble. But there's a new release coming up with a lot of interesting stuff. So for the moment, if I have to be honest, Azure, uh, Amazon is still miles ahead, but they'll be catching up. You can take my word for it. Third vendor is Orchestra. This is the platform as a service implementation on top of Amazon. So all the bits and pieces that I discovered and you played with for Amazon, they use it and they put a layer on top of it. So they have a really smart Nginx setup. They distribute load with load balancers. So they take away that responsibility for you. You should talk to the guys. Uh, I think Helgi is here, Davy is here, Elizabeth is here. Talk to them about it. it they, they use EC2 and they make sure you just push your application using Git and works. I tested it myself and it seems to work nice. There aren't that much management options, so it's basically for the user who wants to say, I just want it to work, push it online. And uh, finally, it's not really related to computing in any way, but it's Cloudflare. Who has heard of Cloudflare? Who has played with Cloudflare? It's basically, it does CDN. It's really, really good at protecting your system from DDoS or other types of attacks. And it, it hooks in well. It's just uh, a sort of DNS-based system. You update your name servers of your domain, and they'll take care of it. And you just mention in the back where it has to be redirected to. And if you ping the DNS host names, it changes all the time. So they have a huge amount of IP addresses. And uh, it's easy. You can use it as a CDN or as a sort of uh, cloud firewalling or protection system. And then eventually we have uh, what we do. We do cloud as well. But we don't do anything of that. We use the same principles. We use the same model, but different implementations. We are fully customized and managed solutions. So if you're really frightened about all that stuff and you want high SLA, come to us. And if you're fairly comfortable with those tools, you just stick with the other tools that I discussed. And in the end, at the end of this talk, I'm going to mention different uh, options or what should be your <coughs> main driver to, to choose Amazon or Azure or anything else. So that seemed quite easy. Like I use the term, it just works a lot, but there are some challenges. There are a fair amount of challenges. Uh, who has tried it before? Who has tried, like, I have, I have an idea that a lot of people here get the clue already, so a lot of stuff I'm going to tell you, are gonna just nod like, yeah, I tried that before. Are there people who tried to work on multiple machines? 
There must be multiple web servers, multiple database servers, multiple of everything. So you guys know that it's not that easy. There is a, a certain amount of challenge. And what are the challenges we're going to discuss? Mainly single point of failure. Like the single point of failure aspect is really important, especially if we, we compare it to the needs of the internet these days, like saying your website is down, that was something I used to say a lot in the 90s and in the 2000s. And nowadays, if you say a website is down, people look at you like, why is it down? We have technology that can fix this. We have the cloud. We have all these sorts of nice aspects. And still, your website is down. Uh, has anyone seen Facebook downtime? Google downtime? Not that much. So yeah, I, I got one page like, sorry, couldn't process your request, but that was not on the search engine. That was on a side app. So these people are smart enough to invest in the right technology and also the right capacity. So single point of failure is a big thing. And uh, talking about, uh, and I'll, I'll be discussing it further, like why should you buy stuff at companies that do unmanaged cloud like Amazon or Azure or Orchestra for that matter? People say, yeah, you don't get a real big SLA. But it doesn't really matter because you compensate this with the number of nodes, so it's bare statistics. Like more <coughs> nodes, less chance of failure. And that single point of failure, you can eliminate that with multiple nodes, multiple database servers, multiple web servers, maybe multiple caching servers, what have you, uh, a good redundant DNS system, which is the source of all evil if you fuck that one up. So uh, keep it in mind. Another strategy is, is, is the shared nothing strategy. It's, uh, it's really important to keep that in mind. Uh, there are different strategies you can use. You can, you can say, like, we're going to have a storage cluster and all the nodes read from that single storage cluster. You have other people that say, well, no, we'll just use the server as a server. It doesn't know of the outside world. It doesn't know that there is a database local. No, there is a cluster of database servers you connect to, a cluster of storage servers you can connect to, and everyone works independently. And that's a pattern you see a lot, and it's a challenge to do that one. I tried it myself, failed miserably learn from my mistakes, listen to people who are smarter than me, and figured out some solutions. And I hope during the next 40 minutes or so, people are going to raise their hands and say, shouldn't you be better off doing this? So I really accept criticism. I really would like you to contribute to this, and maybe we could figure out nice ideas. Another <laughs> thing that is a problem in a lot of cases, nothing is local. Like, remember when you started developing when you were younger and you did your first project? You connect to local host because you know the MySQL server is there. You save, back at the day, maybe we weren't aware of Linux yet, we saved to C backslash something. It was all local, it, it was easy to grasp. But then you switch up to multiple nodes, and the file system, well, storing things locally isn't a good idea anymore for uploaded files or for dy dynamic user content. Maybe the database isn't always local host. And if you're a bad developer and do copy pasting of connection strings all over, and then you have to scale to multiple servers, it's gonna be a mess. Also, when you start using uh, absolute paths for, for, for referencing to files, or if you use fixed host names for your images, and you have to change it all in your files, it's going to be one big mess. Luckily, there's frameworks to help you. There are best practices. But accept the fact that nothing is local. That is something we have to learn. Nothing is local. Not even my file system is local. This is, I think this is the main aspect of my talk, the distributed systems. running. An application on multiple servers requires a bit of skills. And one of the skills you need to master is to deploy and manage it. Like It's easy if you have one server and you do a PHP version upgrade. You do maybe you recompile it or you use packages. And if you have two servers, it's easy as well. You do it on two servers. And then you start having three, four, five, a hundred, a thousand. And then upgrading something isn't that easy anymore. Same thing works for deployment if you have uh, a code base and you have to deploy it to several servers, let's say 100 servers, it's not that easy. We'll figure out solutions uh, during the talk. Another one, how do I deal with sessions? This is a common question. Like A lot of people who use the sessions in their apps, still a fair number of people. We need to tackle that issue. We're going to tackle it. Uh, anyone have an idea? Memcache? I hear Memcache. Yes. I would use Memcache myself, or Redis for that matter. There are still some people who use database. It works as well, but it's way slower. This is a very difficult one for bad developers, read-write splitting. Like, who implements read-write splitting in his code? Who does that right now? Not a lot of people. Some frameworks allow you to do it. Uh, 
if you have a, a nice modular setup uh, and you do use correct patterns, it's easy. If you use dependency injection, you can change your object where it happens and detect if it's a select and insert an update. A lot of people can't do it. Their software design doesn't allow it, so we need to figure out solutions for that. Anyone have an idea how to solve that? Easily? <coughs> no. I have a trick uh, I'll show you in a minute. And that especially applies to platforms as a services, and sometimes also infrastructure as a service. If your server dies, what happens next? Is your setup created to have servers dying off randomly? Because it can happen. Like if you reboot a uh, Azure instance, it'll just drop all your local files. It'll just die on you and come back up. So you need to make sure your architecture is solidly developed to make sure you can deal with this. Dying servers is very common, so accept that fact. So having said all that and processing all that information, I have a really smart person, I'm not sure if you heard of him, who said cloud is for greenfield projects. And that is correct. Who, who is confident to say that every project he has in its repo is ready to work on multiple servers? There are some heroes in the room, thank you. But it doesn't apply to me either. You need to tweak some stuff, and in the end, when your boss says, I have a new project for you, you might say, mm, maybe we could design it. And with design, I'm not talking about the graphics, I'm talking about the architecture, to make it work on multiple nodes, make sure there's levels of abstraction, like the stack that I applied for the infrastructure also applies to the code. If you could stack things up, it'll work better. <coughs> okay, enough theory, let's, let's just do it, let's dig in. This is our setup. We have uh, a bunch of web servers, we have a bunch of MySQL servers, and some file servers. That's the basic farm we use. And then we have some additional magic like caching servers, maybe add a reverse proxy. And in the end, if you really need it, use CDN. Who has experience with CDNs? Or, or let me rephrase the question, who uses CDNs in production? What are you guys using? Speak up. Amazon. Yeah, so Amazon CloudFront, which is the same thing. Other, other vendors? Akamai. Akamai. You have a lot of money, sir. <laughs> you have a lot of money. Yeah. But it's the best there is, right? It's good, right? Are you using ESI features on it? Anyone using ESI features on Akamai here in the room? Yeah, I would love to know more about that. But anyway, CDN, it's out there. It helps us a lot, especially for static data. Who, who uses CDN only for static data? <coughs> Anyone using it on dynamic pages? <coughs> Still a couple. Do you use purging? Okay. Smart people in this room. So there it is. This is our essential setup, the basic setup, a single server setup. And I will use these kind of slides. So there will be a developer bit and a sysadmin bit. And every other slide has a what about the cloud. So this is code. This is more implementation. And this is what the developer does and the sysadmin does. Like if you have a single server, the sysadmin doesn't do anything. It just sits back and drinks some coffee. Whereas the developer says, everything is local. My file system is local. My database server is local. I have a web server here. Life is good. How are we going to do that? I mean, I would be better off skipping this, but this makes a point that it's all so simple to do. If you use Am Amazon, you just set up one uh, EC2 instance. Even better, if you don't have dynamic content and it's all flat HTML and images, just upload it to S3, CNAME it, and make sure you have the option right that says that index.html of index.htm is your default index, and it will work just fine. So for static content, you don't really need to set up anything. Like the web server is there, it responds over REST, you can post new stuff, you can get the stuff. But if you really want to set up a server yourself, go with an EC2 instance, deploy MySQL, or RDS for that matter, and I'll explain what RDS does. And files are local. Now for Azure, it's a different game because we're not talking about disk access. They do have roles that allow you to do RDP and check your files and stuff, but in most common uh, applications, it's just your app, deploy it uh, with a sort of tool set, and I, will, I have slides on that, how to do it. Just push it to the servers and it's out there. And you have a C name that links to a host name and it works. So you don't really need to think about PHP a lot. I did mention include PHP and MySQL in the package script, but for PHP developers, there is a sort of SDK that allows you to install PHP automatically because otherwise you have to package PHP yourself with the DLL, so the Windows install and the PHP exe, drop it into the folders, load it up, have some sort of bootstrapping script. It's a big mess, a lot of fuss. 
So what you can do, there's an SDK that automatically scaffolds the directory structure and has PHP included. And they use web platform installer and run the web platform install commands on the Windows servers in the Azure data center. It bootstraps PHP, it gets MySQL, and it deploys it. That's why it takes a long time to deploy these kind of apps. But as far as I'm concerned, they're going to solve that in the next releases, or I at least hope they will do. So in talking about time to market or time to set it live, Amazon is faster, but you have the hassle of managing the system yourself. Then same deal, or, or more or less the same deal for orchestra. You don't need to care about web servers, and if you have one app, or if you have multiple nodes, it doesn't really matter because you just give it your Git credentials, make sure you have a sort of uh, deployment key in your GitHub, and it automatically deploys. So this is the beginning. What's next? This is fairly classic the load starts to increase and you have to make decisions. And the first decision you're probably going to make is, okay, we need to get rid of that MySQL because that MySQL is, is tearing up my server and is consuming way too much resources. We might want to consider adding an extra server and that extra server is specifically tuned for MySQL. Sounds familiar, right? Okay. So what the developer does, and that is easy as well, he just changes the connection stream. Super easy. Okay, this is lame, I know, but we have to make a point here. It's evolving. And you set up a separate server, you tune it, you make sure it works fast, and you connect to it. Let's talk about the cloud again. How are we going to implement that? We'll set up an extra EC2 instance, do apt get install MySQL server if you're on Ubuntu or Debian, and you're good to go. You can do some tuning. If you say, I really don't want to mess with MySQL, or I really don't want to configure anything, you can use RDS. RDS is, uh, stands for a relational database system. It's there software as a service application for MySQL, or for Oracle, for that matter. And it's really cool. You just click it. It automatically creates a virtual database server. You can add databases. There is some firewalling involved. You can choose maintenance windows for minor uh, releases. Uh, you can do everything. You just click, 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 and you get the invoice. It's a bit steeper. Like I enabled it, and I forgot to disable it, and I got a $100 bill the week after. And I don't recollect sending it to anyone for usage, so <laughs> it was a bit more expensive. But it's worry-free. You don't have to worry about anything. It's there. I never had any issues. Did anyone have issues with RDS? What were the issues? I'm going to use that in the end because then I'm going to say when to choose what or how to mix things without risk, and I'm definitely going to use that. So yeah, if you want less worries in theory, use RDS. It's fairly good, but you need to take precautions if data is important to you. If you can live with it, that it dies off and starts up with the data again and you lose some backups without you knowing, you might want to take some precautions. For Azure, it's, it's more difficult. Like I was at an... Azure course once, and I asked, like, how do you deal with MySQL? How do you make it scale? And it's, it's really difficult to scale because you have to install MySQL on the nodes, and you have to know that nodes could die off at certain points in time, so you could lose all your data. And what you could do if you have good backups or if you do MySQL dump in a correct way at remote locations, you could set up another node, and Azure has roles. Like you have a web role that has an IIS web server in front. You have a worker role that doesn't really have a web server in front of it. You can set up other socket connections, like MySQL. You could set up a MySQL on there and make sure they work together. Please make sure that the uh, data is correctly backed up, because if a node dies, it's going to use your package that is stored elsewhere to get all the data back in. So make sure it's done correctly. You could set up replication, but I would not advise it. What I would advise you is to use SQL Azure instead. They have a sort of software as a service database system, which is, in all honesty, a bit more mature than MySQL. But who is willing to step away from MySQL? I'm not going to raise my hand myself, but everyone sticking with MySQL? Sticking with MySQL? OK, so we stick with MySQL. But there are drivers out there that make sure it works. And I heard, uh, can anyone confirm that PDO driver for SQL Server? Is it out there? No? No one cares? I'm sorry. But anyway, uh, it, sh they sh it should be, f I wouldn't call it fairly easy, but if you use good abstraction layers in your code, you can refactor the SQL statements so they are compliant with SQL Server, and you can use it as well. 
there are more people using Azure. It's still difficult, especially in the world of open source, but I, yeah, I feel like, yeah, it's not that easy. But I think with upcoming releases, a lot of that stuff is gonna be worked on. And Orchestra, well, by default, your database is separate. If you log into their control panel, you have your uh, application deployment and you can click a button to have a database and it comes with a PHP My Admin, and you can log in remotely. Is there EC2 implementation? They also work with RDS, and I heard they work with C round these days for uh, higher traffic and higher volume database. So that was, so you know where we came from, right? One web server with the MySQL server local. We went a bit further, we separated to MySQL. Next up, we see that we get a lot of database traffic, and one database server won't cut it, but one web server is good enough. So what we have is multiple MySQL servers. So what does the developer do? And this is where it gets hard. <coughs> read, write, splitting in code. So who are the people again who did read, write, splitting? You guys sit back and relax. You don't have to do anything. For the others, it's a matter of implementing that either or depending on the sysadmin to find a nifty trick. So what sysadmins do, they set up replication. Like if you do master, master replication, you don't really have to worry about that because you just connect to that server and it will copy it to the next server, and if the load balancer switches and you write to the other server, the data will all work out. But master, master replication, which is basically master, slave, slave, master, when you add a lot of servers to the pool, it gets more difficult. And it's not always necessary to do replication in both ways. You have to define for yourself, do you have more reads, more writes, and balance it out and see if you need multiple masters or if you can use just multiple slaves. And then again, load balancing. Who uses multiple MySQL servers here? How do you load balance them? F5, F5 so networking level. HA Which one? HA proxy. HA proxy, yes, that was I was aiming for. Anyone using it uh, with Amazon? Yes? Yeah. How do you do it? Uh, with the RDS. Uh, with the RDS, okay. Yeah. yeah, with the replica. Yeah, it automatically does that. So there are several ways of doing it. Now here's the trick if your application really doesn't do the read-write splitting well. Have a plugin, plugin for native drivers called MS, and you can define in a sort of INI file what your setup is. So you call it my app, that's, that's the main key. That's also the host you're gonna use in your PDO or your MySQL I or your MySQL, and it defines master and slave servers, and you can add as much servers as you want to. And in the INI file, in the PHP INI file, you're just gonna say enable <coughs> MS and just mention the path to the plugin.ini where the configs are stored. And then you just connect in PDO to my app or here to my app or my app and it will just connect to the back end and will split reading and writing. That's a trick you could use if you run into real trouble. So use it if you want to give me feedback if it's any good. What about the cloud? How are we gonna implement that? Several ways, multiple EC2 instances, set up some HA proxy, uh, or use DNS round robin if you don't have the budget or if you don't really feel like load balancing things yourself. Or you can use RDS with a read replica. So RDS offers you a way to do automatic master-slave, and then you have the separate host names, you add them to the plugin, or if you have read-write splitting involved already, it works out of the box. For Azure, you know the story, I explained it to you, replication. I wouldn't do it, like, I could discuss how you could do it, but it's not advisable. Don't do multi MySQL setups on Azure. And this is where hybrid comes in nicely. If you really want to use Azure for, uh, for web, for comp computation, you could just use RDS or EC2 instances to do the MySQL. You just mix and match and see what works for you. Orchestra uses RDS themselves, or Xeround, which is a new partner they're working with. And then it comes more interesting. We see again that we have one of those challenges called a single point of failure, and we have a web server node that dies. And the web server node dies, there's big panic, managers become angry, people get fired, and they said, okay, we can't stick to one web server, we need multiple web servers. And then there's a lot of challenges as well. You have multiple places to deploy, we have config management we have to take into account. Like if we have user, up, user content like file uploads, and they're stored on one disk, and the next request stores it on another disk. All the files are, are distributed. No one really has the correct data set. And what do we do with sessions? It's really complicated. <coughs> so we need to figure that one out. What sysadmins do is just put the multiple servers behind the load balancer and find a way 
to figure out the session issue and what I would do, and that's what people in the room were saying, use memcached. There is a, uh, or use sticky sessions, but I wouldn't advise that, just use memcached. Who uses memcached apart from the session handling? Who uses memcached in their code? I think a lot of people use memcached. Yes, well, it comes with native session support. Just go to your INI file, change the session handler to memcached D, and add the host and the port, and it will just work. Uh, I check the code and they also make sure that the TTL of your keys, because every session is going to be a key with a value in it, is rightly aligned with the GC max lifetime, session GC max lifetime. So uh, if you increase your max lifetime in your INI settings of your PHP, memcache will follow those rules. So it's, it's, it's a pretty nice way to do it. So that is a, a sort of intermezzo regarding sessions, but how are we going to do it in the cloud? Like how are we going to do it? let's say with Amazon, we could set up multiple EC2 instances and we can use uh, AMIs for, for deployment or, or a bit of AMIs for deployment. I asked the guys from Orchestra, like I was telling David Qualier, I'm looking for a good shared storage solution on Amazon. And I was really expecting a really clever answer and he said, you and me both, my friend. So I was kind of disappointed with that. So shared storage, you could set up uh, a shared storage cluster. You set up EC2 instances and work with a sort of clustered file system and mount that and make sure you can connect with it. There's also a simpler way, but it doesn't really perform well. It's called S3FS. You can hook up a S3 bucket as a volume in your machine and just store your code there, but I'm not so happy with it. So what AMIs do is they just take a snapshot of a single instance and you can redeploy a server with that instance and all the configurations and all the files will be on there. So if you have an app that where the code base doesn't change a lot, you just create an AMI and have automatic scripts that redeploy new servers using the AMI and automatically put them in the load balancer. Anyone's have, anyone has better ideas? Yep, that's also a possibility that you have these like hook, hooking scripts that download all the content and put them on. No, 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 if picture's not, but I'm talking about code base. What do you do for COVID? What's your idea? Uh, uh, yeah, automated deployment, AMIs, you can, you can use whatever you want. Okay, what's your view on things? So there's tools like RightScale or Scaler who, who, who offer tools on top of, not really on top of Amazon, but on top of unmanaged cloud solutions such as Rackspace, uh, Amazon, and there is, there is some added value there, but not everyone is using it, and am I right, they're fairly expensive, right? <coughs> yeah. So if you, if you really need it, and if it makes your life easier, do it, but if you're on a, a more limited budget, or even worse, if your company can't deal with a v variable budget, with variable expenses, stick with something solid. Uh, but deploying to uh, Amazon or, or managing your configuration for Amazon, it's not that easy and it, it requires thought. And here's the magic buzzword, it's called DevOps, making sure developer or, or sysadmins use config deployment, everything that is more at the infrastructure side of the DevOps thing, works correctly, is automated, is version controlled as well. So you might want to use tools like, such as Puppet and Chef. Uh, I think it's Alistair that does a talk on Chef. We have uh, Joshua Thesen from the Netherlands who does a talk on Puppet. If you're ever at a conference where one of these guys are at, talk to them and check out their talk. It, it really connects well to what I'm saying, but then from a uh, configuration management perspective. So what's the next big thing? Offloading static files, because if you, I heard, I think, Bert, you had the problem, right? With he, he has how many, two million? He has two million files, and it's a mess for him to deal with those. Uh, so instead of just managing those, because it's just static data, why don't you offload it to separate servers? That would be nice. So what a developer needs to do is he has, he has some assets ready at hand, and he can <coughs> use them, and you can offload them by synchronizing it. What he could do is store new files on external servers. Uh, he, you know the idea, right? Just all your static data. If you upload it using PHP, just store it in the temporary, 
uh, folder and find a way to, to upload it via RESTful ways that is, is the most common practice. For a sysadmin, he might want to tune an external server depending on the protocol you want to use. Is it SSH based? Are you going to use FTP? Is it RESTful? He's just going to tune it and perhaps put a CDN on top of it. So yeah, uh, with Amazon, it's, it's easy. You could use EC2 instances for separate storage clusters, but my view on thing is just use S3 buckets and for, Ama, for Azure, use, uh, use blob storage. Again, block storage, blob storage. Okay, these are our setups, but then we have to need, we need to think, and how am I doing on time? Still five minutes or so? When the pressure is on, what do you do then? <laughs> Has anyone tried auto-scaling? I find it scary because I know a guy who uses auto scaling and at this lovely Monday morning he got his credit card bill which had a 20k statement on it from Amazon and then he stopped using Amazon and uh, used his own infrastructure again. Auto scaling and load balancing are these things we see that, that come easy to us. We say okay it will just automagically and I use that word very precisely automagically uh, scale to the next level. So I don't really believe in Automagical, I still feel that there is a need for common sense and people need to monitor that and that there's, it's the responsibility of, of sysadmins to have a look at it. CDN and asset offloading works as well. Uh, we talked about it because I have to be honest here, I still have a bunch of slides so we need to, to, to quicken things up. CDN, it's, I think it's fairly clear to the people what CDN is all about. It's about caching. It's also about geographically distributing your files. So if a person connects to the host name, it will resolve it, so it will check what, in which area these people are located, will look for nodes close by and make sure the image is rendered correctly. So that's what CDN does, and it does combine well because you offload all of that stuff. It doesn't really come on your nodes, on your computation nodes, and it's separation of logic, separation of responsibilities. Another thing, and that applies, who, who saw my varnish talk last year? Still a couple of people. I'm not going to tell too much about it, but use it. I used it in a, in a setup and it was simply awesome. I had this stock WordPress uh, that I installed on, a, on the smallest node at Amazon. And I could, with all the default settings, could three to five concurrent connections. Like with AB, I tested it. I released, I, I used Varnish, I unleashed Varnish on top of it. And with the same node, I got 13 to 1600 requests per second. So Varnish works well in the cloud. Uh, I think that iBuildings has this very nice use case about how they used it for new.nl. You should check out, out on SlideShare how to survive the plane crash this talk is called. Uh, it's about how you can make sure that under very, very heavy load, your website still functions correctly. I would advise you to use that for computation. Just put that in front of computation and make sure the CDN takes care of the, of the static images. The mem memcached, what do you use it for? Put it on top of your database, put it in your database abstraction layer, make sure your hits go to memcached first, and if they're not in there, query them from the database, use them for session handling, and there's other ways you can use memcached yourself. Now in the final bit of this talk, we're gonna talk about how to adapt your code, how to make sure you as a developer think about cloud from within your code. And the main reason why you want to do that is for storage purposes. We talked about S3 buckets, we talked about Azure uh, blob storage. This is an implementation using Zen Framework, and I kind of like that. If you use the abstraction layers from in the code, it's going to be really easy for you. So you just abstract it and you say, well, my storage is in Zen Service Windows Azure Storage Blob, and you just put the blob in a certain location and it's stored there. So don't really count on your data being local anymore. Just use an abstraction layer. And what you could do, like this is the Azure implementation, this is the S3 implementation, fairly similar. But Zend framework also offers Zend cloud storage service factory and then you can abstract this and you can make sure it's S3, you can make sure it's Azure, or you can even, and that's the best practice I would advise, if you build upon Zend framework, make sure, for, even if you're on a single node, that you use this library and use the file system one because it will store it to the local file system, and once you start scaling, you just have to change that in your application INI, and you're on a uh, unmanaged cloud system, such as S3, such as Azure Blob Storage. So use it, use it right now. So yeah, this is how it works for local file system. You just, this is your pod, you just get your data stored there. And in the end, there might be some overhead here, but you are ready for scalability. We talked about design patterns already. Dependency injection is a good one. 
if you do correct modular design, and I see that myself, I work in the hosting industry, I've been in the support desk for six and a half years, we see the most crazy lines of code. We see the people who really can't develop. And if they need to scale, if we advise them to go to multiple servers, for a lot of people it's a big mess. If you use the correct design patterns, if you use the correct frameworks, you will be well prepared. And if something has to change, you just it's like pieces of the puzzle. Remove one piece, add another piece, and it will work just fine. Final implementation is, is for an existing app because this was all these things I told you were for new apps. You also have existing apps such as WordPress. Who uses WordPress for blogging or for mini sites? It's a very popular thing. Who uses W3 Total Cache? Do you like it? Uh, yeah, like I see people nodding very enthusiastic. Yes, we love it. I love it myself. I only discovered it recently. It does m multiple levels of optimization for, for cloud based setups. It does page caching very well. You can choose for memcached or varnish. It supports APC as well, but APC doesn't scale well across multiple nodes with a load balancer because it doesn't store it on a central place, it stores it in the local RAM. So that's not really a good idea if you want that same data to be available upon the next request. But Varnish was simply spectacular on it. And what they do have as well is they are Varnish aware in the plugin. You can make sure that it knows your Varnish servers. And if you update the article, it will connect to the Varnish server and purge the cache item. So that's really, really, really good idea to use. It does database and object caching as well in a drop down list. I have some screenshots I will show you. And what I really particularly like is that they have CDN support built in. And static uh, file offloading as well. <coughs> this is one of the things. Like You can choose a variety of vendors to connect your static data to. And they have a sort of uh, synchronization tool, like all the static data, such as JavaScript files, CSS images. You can press a button, and it will automatically synchronize it. I used the uh, S3 uh, simple storage there and uploaded all my data there. And here for Varnish, you just this is local host on my test setup, but this should be the IP of your Varnish server. The next slide is how you can make sure all the, the new data is connected well. So it's a push-pull strategy. What we do here is we push to that, to that bucket. So all the new images that get uploaded get stored on temporary data first, get pushed to S3. And in the end, we know that there is a cloud front on top of it. And the cloud front is the pulling aspect. So every image or static piece of data that is rendered is going to have uh, the special host name, the host name of the CDN, but I'm not going to use the basic host names. I added host names myself. These are uh, C names, and we have multiple C names, and that will optimize your performance from a browser, browser perspective. But if I remind myself correctly, there is a limit of two simultaneous connections per host name. Well, you can tackle it like that. Look, this is, uh, this is for the head, for the body, this is for the closing of the body. So for different aspects where data is loaded, it can automatically make sure you have concurrent connections. And you don't really have to use the dirty host name here. You can add your custom host names. And it works really, really well. These are some other aspects of it. You, you can just synchronize it. Like if you're ready with, a, with a, a basic setup where everything is stored local, you just click this, 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 and this button. And it will have these automatic page loaders. And life is good. How are we doing on time? Yeah, let's, let's finish it off very rapidly. Deploying your code. Uh, let's do a show of hands. Who uses Capistrano for deployment? Nice. Who uses Thing? <laughs> we have the guy who invented Thing over here. Uh, who uses Puppet for uh, Puppet or Chef or other tools for config management? Very nice, very nice. Who uses AMIs from Amazon to do some sort of deployment? A bunch of people as well. Who uses Azure again? Once more, <laughs> he uses Azure. And who uses Orchestra? Who is a customer at Orchestra? Talk to the guys there. These are the final commands I want to show you on how to do uh, Azure deployments. You need to scaffold first, or, or, or you can find these on azurephp.com or .net. You have to scaffold the directory structure, have to create a package based like this is where your files are going to be. Make sure your code is in there. Package it so it makes a sort of zipped or sort of archive, and you can upload it. Uh, Automatically, you can do testing. Dev is true or dev is false. You have an emulator on your system, and it will first run it locally, see if it works. If that works, you can run this command with dev is false. It will make sure the package is ready. Then you have a sort of file with all your settings in it, your online, uh, like your subscription ID. You have your certificates here to connect to. You just add this data and the location of your files. In the end, you're going to use deploy. So this is a bit more complicated, but I know that the guys are working on it. It's 
because they have some limitations, especially for PHP. And this is all written in PHP by a Belgian guy named Martin Balio, and he made it a lot easier for us. And then you have to, you say, create from local because your data is local. You can also upload your package to a uh, blob storage and read it from there, but we say it's local. We have our configuration file with all our credentials in it. This is the name of your uh, computation subdomain. This is the name you give your deployment because every deployment can have a different name. And this is a cool one, by slot. So first, automatically, you have a staging environment there. It automatically uploaded the staging, and you say start immediately. So the node automatically works. You've tested it on the host name, and then you said, OK, let's swap it. Let's swap my Azure instance to production. It automatically puts it to production. It works. And then in the end, you say, OK, we want multiple nodes. Well, new instance number two. It works on two, add five, and it scales well. So in the end, make sure you mix and match well. And I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip even skip this about the management models. I could say that managed cloud services we offer are like replacements for the old dedicated servers you have, and unmanaged cloud is virtual colo. And I could talk about hours about this. But in the end, know what to choose, know what your responsibilities are, know what your company is, uh, finds important, and just make choices. Just mix and match. Buy stuff at our company. Buy stuff at other companies and build something that scales well. And very important to close this presentation off, don't lock yourself in with vendors. Make sure your application is made in that way and your procedures are built in that way that you can easily move from one vendor to the other. So in the end, this is the magical world we live in. We just vacuum clean. And we know there are smart guys taking care of the infrastructure. That's it.